getting criminalized for being misfits. We have thousands, tens of thousands of people in New York now have low-level criminal records, and it makes it hard to find jobs, and a massive increase in people getting tickets just for disorderly conduct, even talking in a loud voice. You could be a kid from the Bronx who is going to college and a conviction for marijuana possession will cut off your student loans. People are evicted from their apartments. They can't get into public housing. I mean, the uh, consequences are really tremendous. And I would go around and I would talk to people in New York City, and they, liberal people, progressive people, would say, oh, well, you know, we've had this miracle in New York and some people would say oh yeah Malcolm Gladwell's idea of broken windows and some people you know knew that it wasn't his idea but that he had popularized it they'd read about it in the New Yorker and his book The Tipping Point I would never try to speak to what his intent was but I think the impact that he had was to serve as basically a marketing force for this idea he truly popularized it You know, I sometimes fall in love with particular um, theories, and then you learn subsequently it just wasn't as neat and tidy as you thought. Or is there anyone in particular that you're thinking uh, of? I've got one, but I'd love to hear yeah. what, what. I would love to redo the chapter on crime in the Tipping Point, just because I feel like we have learned so much more about crime now in the ten years since I've written that book. And I think I was too in love with the uh, kind of broken windows notion. But I think I was so enamored by the metaphorical simplicity of that idea um, that I overstated its importance. Well, the problem was that they started using broken windows as a euphemism for misfits. Right? The, the, remember I said to you before that there was one that I, that, that I thought you'd... you'd got wrong. It was that one. It was exactly the same one. I went to the Bronx and met a, a, a defender uh, in this group called the Bronx Defenders mm -hmm. who said that when she started trying to talk to people about aggressive policing, mm -hmm. um, quite often they say, oh, no, 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 aggressive policing works. I, uh, Malcolm Gladwell says oh, it works. Dear. I read yeah. about it in the tipping yeah. point. Um, so she said that, it, that she couldn't speak to your intent, mm -hmm. but... Um, the effect that that story had was that it became a sort of uh, a marketing yeah. tool for... You know, I think it's important not to discount that whatever happened, and a million things happened, and I try actually return to the subject of criminality, New York City policing in my, this book, too. Um, whatever happened is very complicated and really interesting. Mm -hmm. But do you worry what I just said to you about... about Kate going around and people say, oh, no, aggressive policing's OK. Yeah, I mean, it, it happened with outliers where people took an argument, a relatively nuanced argument about the 10,000-hour rule, and took it to mean that anyone who does anything for 10,000 hours will be really good at it, which quite plainly the book didn't say, mm -hmm. but that's how people, some people, interpret it. But that's a kind of, that's an occupational hazard of writing books about ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, there's been lots of studies since Broken Windows mm -hmm. of people saying that there is no evidence to suggest that, that you know, declaring war on yeah. graffiti artists and fair dodgers oh, yeah, that's... Had, has any impact on the reduction of but major crime. But something did. So, yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm well... I no longer think... This is why I, I would love to revisit that. You have to remember that there are quite literally thousands and thousands of New Yorkers walking around today who would be dead. So there's something... Something fascinating has happened. It is something quite different from what I imagined was happening when I wrote Tipping Point. But the problem with broken windows is, is it's obviously it was more than just an inconvenience to somebody getting stops and frisked. You know, if you're caught with a little bit of marijuana in your pocket, suddenly you, you, know, you don't get college funding. And so this whole generation of people's lives were kind of really seriously, you know, harmed as a result of broken windows. I wondered, when, when I told you that story about Kate and you looked pain for a moment, I, I wondered whether uh, part of the reason why was because you've said that you don't think journalists should have power, and there was a story about mm -hmm. you having power. Well, I think you're probably overstating matters when you say I have power. These books are not policy prescriptions. They're conversation starters. Um, and... 
uh, when I say I want to start a conversation, what I mean is I would like to present a series of ideas and give people access to research to get them thinking about how to be smarter about something. But I would never go so far, I would never presume that I have all the answers. You know, I don't think a journalist, that's not what journalists are supposed to do. Um, we stand in the middle between um, the public and um, people who have more definitive understanding of things. Malcolm doesn't say it, but I think the tipping point crime story haunts him a little. I think he feels remorseful about it. What's definite is that soon after that story, his work became more about highlighting social injustice. To my mind, the turning point was a story I wrote called Million Dollar Murray, um, which is still one of the most, my fav may, I, may be my favorite thing I've ever written, which is a story about homelessness. Million Dollar Murray started in the same way that most of Malcolm's stories start. He stumbled on an academic study in an obscure journal. This one was about how much it cost the state to keep homeless people homeless. Who was the academic that you stumbled on? I just can't, I can't remember the process. I never remember the process. Was it a guy called Dennis? Maybe, yes. Dennis it, yeah, Colhane. Maybe. That's it, that's Dennis Colhane, exactly, who'd yeah. done all the great studies. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Your memory is better than mine. Well, my memory's not quite as good as you think because yesterday I, I, I met Dennis Colhane and he- Oh, you did? I was feeling that because I went up to the Bronx and, um, you know, discovered this woman who was, you know, kind of you know, mad at you for, for um, uh, basically convincing everybody that Broken Windows was a great idea. I thought I had to, um, I had to, you know, do the opposite. Dennis Colhane is a professor of social policy and psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. His research that caught Gladwell's attention called for a controversial rethink on how society should pay for the problem of homelessness. The study I did um, back in 2002 showed that the average chronically homeless person in New York City was using over $40,000 a year in taxpayer-funded services. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, they were still on a cardboard box on a street corner. Right. So clearly, there could be better uses of the $40,000 than that. And you wrote all of this up in an academic paper, right? Yes, several, yeah, many what, papers. What were, they, what were they called? You know, they had academic, boring academic titles. You right. know, public service reductions associated with placement of chronically homeless people in assisted housing, things like that. Yeah, what yeah. else? Or I did um, a typology of homelessness, cluster analysis, look uh, at homelessness. Yeah. I can never understand, I read a lot of academic papers in my job, but I can never understand why they're always given such terrible <laughs> names. Why? Is it because you don't want to come over as like kind of jazzy? Well, you're, no, you actually, uh, you, you occasionally can try to be jazzy, but you don't want to be too cute. Dennis's papers advocated simply giving homes to the homeless. In the long run, it would be far cheaper than constantly paying for ambulances and medical bills and overnight shelters. His work was well received in academic circles, but invisible to the outside world. Until Malcolm Gladwell phoned him. What do you remember the telephone conversation? I didn't give it that much credence. I had no idea where this was going to end up. Ah, so okay. So you no so you don't remember that much of the conversation? No, no. Do you remember like right. any of the conversation? Very little. Mm -hmm. Until suddenly, it showed up <laughs> in print in the New York. Yeah. I want your money, but your money ain't right. So I'm packing it all in. What Gladwell had done was tell a story of a homeless man called Murray. These two cops in Reno, they had worked with this guy, Murray, day in and day out. They were, they, you know, they were picking him up off the street, taking him to the hospital, taking him to the jail if he got feisty. And was, so they decided that they were uh, going to do their own little study of how much money had they spent on Murray. And they were the ones who came up with the $100,000 a year, and they'd been doing it for 10 years. OK. So he was Million Dollar Murray. He was Million Dollar Murray. It would have cost less money to put him in a hotel with a full-time aide than it would have been to let him live on the streets. Once you, once you, that insight kind of enters your brain, it changes your whole attitude towards something like homelessness, which the notion is always 
that we can't afford to help them. And when you realize that, no, 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 that's exactly wrong. You can't afford not to help them. They're bankrupting you on the street. In the article, it had a dramatic impact, actually, mm -hmm. because from that day forward, I couldn't hardly go into a room where someone didn't mention it for a good, almost a year. Ironically, it was itself a tipping point mm. for the field. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So there's no downside to that story at all. I, I, I would have a hard time finding the downside yeah. to that story. Yeah, that's great. That yeah. he, he has that power and he wielded it, wielded it for good. Yeah, yeah. Before Gladwell came along, there were 30,000 rooms like this in America. Rooms where the door keys were basically just given to homeless people. Now there are 120,000, in large part because so many housing officials were moved by Gladwell's story about Murray. So you've, you've kind of really changed. I mean, you were pretty, you were kind of right wing, weren't you, in the 80s? Were you? As a kid, oh, yeah, yeah, it's totally right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because I was growing up in a socialist country, and I was, I had no opportunities for rebellion. I was a well-behaved, geeky, you know, distance runner growing up in the Bible Belt of Ontario. My opportunities for misbehavior were so constrained that in my, in my high school, the rebels smoked cigarettes. That's, that's it. That's what rebellion was. Smoke. And I couldn't smoke cigarettes. I was a runner. What was I left to do? I had a big picture of Reagan on my wall, and I had, you know... What did, what did your parents do when they walked in and saw a big picture of Ronald Reagan on your wall? I, to, I mean, could, I could not have cared less. If you're the parent of a teenager and you understand that the, your child's teenage rebellion is manifesting itself as a love for reactionary political figures, I think you're delighted. But, but something definitely changed between the more frivolous stories and, and the broken window story, yeah. and then you write in these much more important and heart and right place stories like Million Dollar Murray. Did, 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 yeah. a, did a thing happen to make you change? Uh, I don't know, it's an interesting question. I think of my early writing as just being kind of flashier. If I think back to the, let's go back to the tipping point. If I compare my current self to my 1998 self, I am, would be appalled today by the music I was listening to in 98, by the clothes I was wearing in 98, by my haircut in 98, I'm not dating the same girl I dated in 98. There's nothing about my life that resembles my 98 life. I mean, the world's different. <laughs> why wouldn't I go back and revisit my ideas? Like, I don't understand why people abstract your ideas from everything else in your life. Some people, like if I told them I'd gone up to the Bronx to, to kind of show that something that they'd done 10 years ago, you know, had these bad effects, the interviewee would kind of feel kind of annoyed with me for doing that. Yeah. But you don't seem to feel annoyed. Yeah, I'm just, I, good for you. I think it sort of shows real enterprise. Something that I wrote compelled you to go to the Bronx. Isn't that the greatest, single greatest outcome for a writer? If you haven't gotten things wrong, then you've never gotten anything right either, right? You sort of, you haven't made any progress unless you're sort of willing to try out um, an argument and I don't think you can be an honest journalist and not want to rewrite every book you've ever written. You quote the Manchester United football chant. Yes. Build a bonfire, build a bonfire, put the Scousers on the top, put the city in the middle and burn the fucking And a lowercase city, and I should have city. uppercased yeah. it to refer to Man City. Because you assumed that yes. the city that they were being thrown in the middle of the bonfire was Liverpool, yeah. but it's not, it's Manchester, it's, it's yes. Manchester City Football Club. The classic outsider's mistake, thinks he can stroll into a foreign country <laughs> and discern the difference between Man City and Liverpool. Right. No. Uh -huh. <laughs> so are you going to do anything about it? Is it is yeah, I'm going to fix it. You are going to fix it? No, of course. Have you got time? The book's coming out like well, a couple no, of the weeks. second round. I mean, you always get another go at it.